now we are broadcasting and people will start to come on to the webinar itself. We have already five participants. Hello everyone that it is attending. Thanks very much for coming over. We're going to start the presentation at um, in five minutes, 25 to three. Uh, we are joined with uh, with James from from Barter Wealth. How are you doing, James? Uh, very good, thanks. Cheers, Andre. It's cool. very uh, warm in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> the weather normally closer to Maltese weather. I'm sorry, it's weather that you're probably more familiar with in Malta or Spain. Yeah, actually, actually yes. I I rather have a few friends that. That they are in uh, in the UK, and I read that during this week it is going to have you're going to have nice weather, which mm -hmm. it is always thankful at the end of the day. True. Brilliant. We're going to start broadcasting literally in um, in three four minutes. Cool. It's good to see a few familiar faces already. Carla, I'm seeing you there. We're going to have our webinar next week. It's good to know. Johnny also, Rajiv, good, excellent. If you, if you give us a little bit more of uh, two or three more minutes, um, so we allow the rest of the people to, uh, to join and we're going to, uh, to officially start the, the webinar. Here we are with, with James from Barter Wealth, and myself from CSB Group going to be speaking about global mobility in a post-pandemic world. James will be speaking about the Irish Residence My Investment Program, Irish IP, and myself about St. Lucia and a little bit of um, basically CBI and, and REI planning. Okay. Okay, we're already there, two more minutes. And we're going to start broadcasting. Just uh, a little bit of housekeeping for everyone. Um, as you know, you are attendees in, in this webinar, so you cannot speak. Um, if you want to ask us, uh, myself or James, any question, just please um, do not do not use the chat, as uh, the chat basically, it is, it is just a chat. Please use the Q&A section. And as long as the, um, the conversation, as long as the, um, the webinar goes, uh, just if you have any doubts, whatever, just write them down there. And at the end of the webinar, myself or James, we're going to, uh, to answer them. Um, and, uh, and that will be, I mean, the, the webinar will take around 45 to 50 minutes, perhaps a little bit more. And uh, then at the end, we're going to be answering all your questions. So that basically has a, a little bit more flow. Uh, a little bit more flow to it. So the first, uh, the first set I will be making the introductions, formally introducing uh, James, uh, speaking about uh, investment migration, basically in the St. Lucia program, and then I will pass it on to, to James, who will be speaking about the, the investment, um, the Irish IP or Residence My Investment program. So we're going to wait just one more minute uh, to see if there is any other attendee that uh, they would like to, to join uh, and then we're going to formally speak now but I think that we are almost set to go. Excellent. So we're going to, to start the webinar is 25 to 3. So, so we're going to officially start. So as we say, that, good morning the Americas, good afternoon Europe and the UK, and good evening China and Southeast Asia. As you may of you already know, my name is Andre Gutierrez, and it's my pleasure to host this special edition of CSP Group webinar series. 
Today with James Harshorn, which is the CEO and co-founder of Paratra Wealth, we are going to be speaking about global mobility in a post-pandemic world. This webinar will take approximately 45 minutes. Uh, after this, we'll be able to uh, answer any of your questions. Alternatively, you can always reach us on uh, our respective emails. We said before, we're going to be, um, I'm going to be giving a brief introduction to CS3 Group Investment Migration, then St. Lucia Citizenship by Investment Program, and then uh, James Howard, the Irish IIP Residence Program. And we're going to see how these two solutions, a residence in Europe through the Irish IIP and uh, St. Lucia Citizenship in this case, it is quite uh, a good combination to, um, to have an alternative citizenship and an alternative residence for your family, and especially your beloved ones, uh, due to the, the particularities of, of Ireland as a country itself. Um, so basically the next uh, webinars that we're going to hold are going to be the 2nd of July with uh, Carla Cerqueira from Amicor Group. We're going to be talking about post-COVID-19 stru structuring, global solutions to private clients, and then the 9th of July, we're going to have a panel about Grenada and Intervisa with a range based law firm and Paragon Principal. Uh, now I'd like to do uh, a few polls. So if you would like to take just uh, three or four seconds to answer this poll to see a little bit uh, for where you are, you are watching, we're going to be, um, it will, will be a nice, uh, a nice, nice things to have. So. Normally Europe, it is the one that takes the lead, as normally happens in our series, uh, and then basically Asia. So a few more coming in, in, that's it. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, guys. As we said, Europe and Asia mostly. So um, a little bit of words of uh, introduction to, um, to our company, to CSV Group. CSV Group is based in Malta since over 30 years in the financial service industry, and we are regulated by uh, the Malta Gaming Authority, Malta Financial Service Authority, IAP Agency, MRP Agency, and Commissioner of Revenue, amongst others. Uh, within CSP Group Umbrella, we have Vacancy Center, our recruitment arm, reaches where we are going to be opening our third office space uh, the 1st of July, and Malta Sotheby's International Realty, that obviously cut uh, for luxury real estate for uh, private clients and also commercial real estate. Within CSP Group, we offer Product client services, investment migration, real estate, relocation, corporate services, company formation, and so on, tax and legal and regulated industries, I gaming and fintech. But that's enough fit. So we're going to here to, to speak in our speakers today. Uh, uh, James Harshan, as we said before, CEO and co-founder of Paratra Wealth. And James has been working primarily on real estate and immigration investment for the past 10 years. He has an unrivaled market knowledge and an in-depth understanding of immigration products, allowing him to effectively promote the Bartra brand and investment products to immigration agencies in mainland China and Southeast Asia. James also maintains a very good relationship with the Irish government, submitted several proposals to the Irish government, and, uh, result, which resulted in positive changes to the Ireland Immigration Investor Program. So that's James. Hey, James, how are you doing? All good? Very good, thanks. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Andres. Yes, all Brilliant. good. Excellent, fantastic. And myself, uh, Andres, uh, Investment Migration Advisor, most of you already know me. So, um, Basically, in terms of uh, CSB Group uh, and Citizenship and Residence Planning, these are the programs that we cater for, EU Residence Program, Ireland with, uh, with Borrowed Wealth, Malta, Portugal, uh, and Spain, EU Citizenship Programs, Malta and Cyprus, and Caribbean programs, as well as Montenegro. Um, now I'm going to be speaking about this, as we're going to be seeing uh, Citizenship and Residence in a packet. I'm going to give a little bit of overview on, on this, so we are all in the same uh, in the same place. It wouldn't take long, but it's going to be a good, uh, a good understanding why we are presenting uh, these uh, Caribbean option and uh, Irish residency with, with James. So basically at the end of the day, what is citizenship and what is residence? Res residence refers to the right of leave, work and study, normally under certain conditions. In the case of immigration, by investment, obviously you will need to have your investment in the country. Taxation may be affected and also this may give uh, travel flexibility. Some cases they do, some cases they don't. That, that basically would depend. And citizenship it is basically the right to apply for a passport, voting rights, state protection. At the end of the day, if you apply for a residence by investment program, eventually you will be able to attain citizenship. And with citizenship, you have your, 
your main rights um, of residents. Just um, as, a, as a recap, I mean, my, my, my own parents used to tell me basically that in life you, you can choose everything apart from your parents and apart from the place you are born. Um, and these, condi these conditions, basically, your citizenship possibilities, your education possibilities uh, for you, for your children, and so on. So a way of, uh, for example, acquiring residence by investment uh, with, uh, with James uh, and the Irish Residence by Investment Program may mean to have uh, an enhance, enhanced education possibility for, for your children, um, future business, uh, an enhanced, enhanced lifestyle. It's quite, quite an interesting combination with uh, a citizenship program like the Caribbean Options in St. Lucia that give that uh, panorama of uh, global mobility and so on. So that, having said that, uh, citizenship and residence planning was uh, a luxury, uh, started as a luxury tour. At the end of the day, that was the historical rationale for investment migration, always a symbol of status and even a luxury good. A, a luxury good. It started with the St. Kitts CBI program in the 84, the Canadian AAP in the 86. But then the program, the, the program started to develop in the needs as well. So it became basically a more, uh, as a policy insurance, as we could see it. As time passed through and needs evolved, uh, the need for global mobility has always been there, but people started to look at education, at safety, at uh, health, uh, healthcare system. And those, those are the things that uh, we can see, for example, with, uh, with, with the Irish program, in gi giving that access to, to high level education and, and so on, and with many other programs like that happens with Malta and Cyprus, but specifically in this case, as we're going to see today with James with the Irish IAP program. The needs, they evolved, and uh, now with the, with the pandemic on the way, uh, we see why basically having a citizenship and investment migration is an asset tool. At the end of the day, having an alternative citizenship or a residence or a combination like we're going to see in this case, gives a niche against geopolitical risk and market volatility. Basically, it protects from that inherent risk that, that we were talking at the beginning uh, of being uh, a citizen or a resident of a country. It minimizes the, the risk of a global turmoil and maximizes the possibility of profits, especially if you are investing in real estate. Um, it gives you the accessibility to market. When applied through a real estate-based investment, applicants can obtain appreciation uh, appreciation capital and rental yields. Basically, like any other um, assets, like fine wine investment, gold invest, gold, in, gold investment, uh, citizenship and residency is an asset tool that helps to diversify financial and citizenship portfolios. Um, so basically, these sort of things, citizenship and residence give, uh, it is basically what we would call economic migration. When COVID start, stops, basically, I want to know where uh, I and my clients want to start. Um, it is a path to an effective economic migration and business relocation. It allows basically getting to a safe harbor. At the end of the day, how good it is the healthcare system, how good it is the, the, the education. It is a low abiding population, basically, like we can see in Ireland and, and in the Caribbean, mostly in Europe. It also allows to, uh, financial diversification by investing in different assets, government bonds, real estate, and so on, and therefore into tax efficiency. If planned carefully and preventively, these uh, can help with tax optimization structuring and obviously on a case-by-case -case basis. And obviously a tax efficient structure, it also gives um, better wealth preservation as the type of investments that we are looking in. And finally, something that we see mostly with the Caribbean programs, lifestyle at the end of the day, flexibility, a second residence, and so on. So, I mean, these are the type of things that we're going to see in, in the day of today, a safe harbor, um, financial diversification, tax efficient, basically, uh, lifestyle with, um, with the Caribbean citizenship and a safe harbor for the family and education possibilities for, um, for the family in, in Ireland and, uh, and a bright future, which is the most important thing. Now it is a good investment now. I mean, at the end of the day, citizenship and residence planning, it is an all weather investment tool. Like gold or wine investment, basically it brings up its value in turbulent time. And when the, the market is more, more flat, it is more normal like last year, it gives you that mobility, that accessibility to education anyway. 
Um, it also, it, now doing it now, it helps to strategize time because even though we are at the last stages of the COVID-19 confinement, it allows us to basically start working uh, promptly and preemptively. And finally, most of the process, they can be done remotely. So basically, that's, that's, that's enough of that. Now what we're going to see first um, in the next three, four slides and before passing it on to James, it is uh, the St. Lucia Citizenship by Investment Program. And first, what I would like to give you, it is an overview, a country overview of St. Lucia. St. Lucia is a small country in the Caribbean. Uh, it has approximately 180,000 uh, inhabitants and is part of the Commonwealth. Uh, Commonwealth. Its uh, main English, its main uh, language is English as well. Uh, the Queen is the head of the state. I mean, it's a country that uh, in its 45, uh, 40, 50 years of history has never defaulted, uh, something that doesn't happen with my, my home country. I'm originally from Argentina, and as you may know, our country has defaulted around 11 times in the past 180 years. So it is not a, a really good backtrack for, for, my, uh, for my, my home country. But that hasn't, didn't happen with, with St. Lucia. And uh, I mean, it's a small country in the Caribbean and, and you will say, I mean, why, why it is good to, to get a Caribbean citizenship? And I have been advising on, uh, on citizenship planning and citizenship and residence by investment programs uh, for quite a few years now, and uh, especially on, on Caribbean programs. And um, Caribbean jurisdictions, even though they are small uh, economies, it has quite a few amount of, of benefits. Um, there are quite a few. I mean, first, I mean, you have visa free access, that lifestyle that we were speaking before, uh, and that, uh, that can be paired very well with a web program like, um, like, like the Irish IAP that James is going to speak later. Gives you access to 140 uh, countries plus, UK and EU and Hong Kong, uh, as, as many of these. It has a short time frame, between three or four months, and everything can be done remotely. And finally, and quite interestingly, and this very, very recent news, um, not the fact that you can include family members, you can include family members, but this has changed yesterday. Uh, and uh, changes, they are not small, they are very, very important. So, uh, whereas before, the qualifying age for a children dependent was 18 years old, now, a children dependent can be up to 25 years, 21 years old, sorry. Adult dependents, the age is up to 30 years old. They do not need to be in full-time education, but they need to be obviously financially dependent on the main applicant. So there is not that limit on 25, 26 years old, need to be uh, in, the, in school, university, masters, whatever. I mean, a children, uh, daughter, son can be 28, 29, be financially dependent on the main applicant and be uh, included as a, as a dependent. Parent dependent, is, instead of 65, it is 55 years old, and they do not need to be living with a main applicant, something which is very common. I mean, a high net worth individual or a high net worth family, normally the parents, they will be living separately unless in certain regions of the world. So this is actually quite, uh, quite a very good thing. And the most important thing, actually, is that siblings can also be um, can also be added. I mean, siblings under 18 years old, unmarried, and with the consent of the parent or the legal mar or the legal guardian, can be included as dependents of the applicant. So that is quite quite important. So we see that the benefits is that this cuts to big uh, families. Dominica, the day of today, the Commonwealth of Dominica, the day of today, has post has passed uh, new regulations in terms of dependents. Um, but in terms of St. Lucia, it responds to that wide, um, to those wide families. It gives you visa free access, that accessibility that complements with the Irish IP, with the education, healthcare, um, and, um, and European um, base that, that applicants can have, especially when, when people look at it from Southeast Asia and the Asian regions. And, small time frame. People, they don't need to, uh, to travel to, to, um, to St. Lucia in order to be granted with a, with a passport, and it takes approximately three to four months. So you can start it together with the Irish IAP, or you can start it after or before. Uh, it is not, not a precondition. So those are the main benefits uh, of it at the end of the day, and how, at the end of the day, how to get St. Lucia citizenship. The St. Lucia citizenship, it is uh, a real, um, a citizenship by investment program. It people basically applicants will need to make any of three different uh, investments, not the three at a time, 
but one of uh, they, they can choose if it is a real estate investment, a government bond investment, and a contribution. In this webinar, for time's sake, we're going to focus on um, the bond investment and on the contribution uh, amount. The real estate, we're going to leave it separately, but if you would like to know more, please come, uh, come back to me. So the most important thing I'm going to focus on the St. Lucia government bonds investments and the COVID-19 bonds. St. Lucia has a very interesting option where applicants can invest in St. Lucia government bonds, uh, which are non-interest bearing. Uh, so basically, the interest it is it is zero. But after a certain time, as we're going to see, five or seven years, uh, the applicants they will get their their money back. As we said before, Solution has never defaulted. It's a small country, but it's very uh, it's very strong. Obviously, reliant on on tourism. Um, but it's a very very interesting economy at the end of the day, and very interesting country. And this is a very interesting option because um, for a family up to four uh, people, the investment of um, in government bonds, it is of 250,000 euros. If it is a single applicant, there is a holding period of five years. If uh, it is a main applicant and a spouse, a holding period of six years, and for a family of four, of four um, the holding period is seven years. However, if you would like to have uh, a holding period of five years, you will have to invest 300,000. So, I mean, it is quite uh, quite interesting on that side. There is there is the flexibility. And if, and if you have um, a big family, each additional qualifying dependent uh, would need to, you will need to make an investment of an extra 15,000. So for example, if you are a main applicant and a spouse with two children, um, that will be uh, 250,000 euros plus two other dependents, let's say uh, two other siblings or other, two other parents, that will be 280. Plus um, other fees, you have due diligence fees. In this case, there are no processing fees and uh, the amendments for the COVID-19 government bonds reduce the government fee considerably. Whereas before was 50,000 euros, now it is 30,000 euros. So it is quite, quite interesting on that side. So that is quite a very, very attractive option, basically with a capital outlay of around uh, 300, $280,000. Um, applicants can be granted with the St. Lucia passport and uh, after five years or six or seven years, depends, um, they will be um, repaid that, that investment. And again, this is a non-bearing interest uh, bond. Finally, the second option that we're going to cover today, it is uh, the contribution to the National Development Fund. This is a pure contribution. As I always like to say, the money goes and it doesn't come back. Uh, this means that it is in relation to the National Development Fund and the government basically, they use this, um, this liquidity, these contributions to fund um, education, to fund uh, schools, hospitals, airports, etc. and so forth. So the main numbers are for a single applicant, a uh, hundred thousand euros, a hundred thousand dollars, sorry, for a main applicant and a spouse, a hundred and forty, and for a main applicant, spouse and two children, a hundred and fifty thousand euros. This is a contribution again, it is uh, paid and does not come back. There are additional fees for dependents in addition to a family of four, uh, fifteen thousand thousand dollars, and uh, for each additional dependent of any age. So, for example, for a single applicant and a parent dependent, that will be twenty five thousand euros. Again, here you have um, other fees. In this case, yes, processing fees are applicable. Due diligence fees, like in the other case, and um, another thing which is very important, I didn't mention before, in terms of uh, of additions, the newborn additions. Whilst before there was a fee of 25,000 euros, the newborn additions, they have a fee of 500 euros, very, very considerably reduced. Um, just in terms of how it works, uh, the application that is prepared, once it is submitted, we pay the, the, the duty, due diligence fees and processing fees are paid. And once the application is approved by the government, uh, the applicants will need to make the, con the contribution or the government bond investment. So there is no capital at risk in that side. So that is what I would like to, to wrap up with. I mean, it is a completely um, remote program and it pairs very, very well with the Irish proposition uh, in terms of education, basically because the, the St. Lucia passport gives that mobility uh, in terms of a passport, in terms of a citizenship. 
and it bears quite nicely with uh, the Irish proposition that, that James will, will present now. So, so now um, I will hand it over to you, James. Uh, we'll stop uh, screen sharing and um, we'll hand it over to you. Okay, I'll just uh, share my screen here. And okay, is that uh, sharing? That's sharing. If you press F five, we're going to have it in the full in the full screen. Okay. Did that work? Full screen. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, if you now we, we don't see oh, the full sorry. screen, but we see all the all the different. There screen. we go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Technical issues. Okay, good stuff. Thank you, uh, thanks again, Andres. Um, yeah, very comprehensive overview. So, um, as mentioned, I'm going to speak about the Ireland IAP program, the um, benefits of Ireland, and then just a little bit about our uh, our projects as, as a developer. So, the Irish program is is one of the most straightforward programs out there. It's a residency program, uh, which means that uh, you're entitled to Irish residency as a result of making an investment in Ireland. The process itself is open to main applicants. Uh, these would be non-EU um, applicants, uh, anyone over the age of 18. Um, in terms of family members who are also part of the one investment, that would be um, your spouse or legal partner. Uh, children under 18 will automatically qualify and then dependent children between 18 and 24 provided that they are not married and um, financially dependent. Um, so those are, those are the conditions and those are the people who qualify within the family unit. Um, you, uh, applica applicants would also need to display a minimum net worth of 2 million euro. Uh, they need to be able to display they have no criminal record worldwide. Uh, and there's also uh, a source of funds requirement to show that their funding has been legally acquired. Um, the investment itself is a 1 million euro investment, and that needs to be invested for a minimum term of three years. Um, some of, inv of the investments are five years, but the minimum, according to the law, is three-year investment. The process is very uh, quick and very straightforward. So the document preparation, um, this is sort of like putting your file together and having various documents notarized. Um, this usually takes around a month. Um, and that's something that our team would help applicants with. We've done over 250 uh, successful cases. So we've got a great wealth and experience in this field. Um, and all of our applicants have been successful. So um, it's uh, something we're very good at. Um, so that process will take about a month. Then the, um, once the application has been submitted to the Irish government, they then will review the application. Um, and within around a four month period, they should issue, issue a letter of approval, uh, provided the application has been successful, they'll issue a letter of approval. Um, so after receipt of this approval, that's when people are required to transfer their funds. So from a risk management point of view, that's a very attractive, uh, part of the process um, because you, there's no condition under with there's no there's no circumstance under which you could make an investment and not be approved so the way that happens is that the approval is received the investment is made and then after that um, applicants are invited to Ireland where they would receive their actual residency card um, so the whole thing is sort of inside six months which as European residency programs go it's, it's probably the fastest um, so that's a very and as you can see from the steps it's a very straightforward process um, so there's also um, no language requirements. Ireland is an English speaking country, as most of the people probably know. Um, so English is our first language. Um, and then the residency requirements in Ireland are very low under this program. So uh, I think there's an understanding that a lot of these um, applicants are, are running businesses in their home country and that they wouldn't be able to fully relocate to Ireland at this stage. So the residency requirement is only actually one day per calendar year. So that means that um, the applicants would only actually need to visit Ireland once a year to maintain the residency status. Um, so that, that in itself is very attractive also. Um, the way the um, uh, visa is, is, is granted is that it's a two year uh, permanent residency. So it's actually called stamp four. It's, um, it's granted for two years and then renewed for three. 
uh, and after that initial five year that period, it's renewed every five years. So it's um, renewable into, into perpetuity actually. Uh, and, and the conditions are that you stay in Ireland for one day per year. So there's another uh, interesting part to um, Ireland um, as a country. Um, so there is a road to citizenship. This isn't a citizenship program. Um, it's a residency program, but um, anyone who is living in Ireland um, can nationalize there if they spend the requisite time. So there's a residency requirement to live in Ireland for, uh, for five years. And if people meet that requirement, then they would qualify for an Irish passport. The Irish passport is, is, is very interesting. Obviously, it's a full EU passport, but this particular point uh, is quite interesting. We have um, something that we share with the UK called the Common Travel Area, which was set up in the 1920s. And the Common Travel Area basically allows for Irish citizens to um, live and work and, and even vote uh, in the UK and vice versa. So um, UK citizens can live and work in Ireland and, and in, in certain circumstances can actually vote here as well. So uh, it's almost like a reciprocal passport. Um, so this becomes particularly interesting after Brexit um, when there will be invariably travel restrictions uh, on UK. Um, so the, uh, the Irish passport will actually be the only passport in the world that would grant access to both the European Union and uh, the United Kingdom. Um, so that's a quite, a, quite an interesting um, sort of benefit to, to an Irish passport, but to being an Irish national. Um, so our um, company, Bartra Wealth Advisors, uh, we're um, a part of the Bartra Group, which is one of Ireland's largest developers. Um, and we established this company in the middle of 2016. The idea being that we would use this vehicle to raise money specifically for Ireland's IIP, which is the Immigrant Investor Program. So uh, the, the company is founded by myself and Richard Barrett. Uh, Richard is a very famous Irish real estate developer. Um, he'd be one of the best known developers in Ireland. Uh, he's also had companies in uh, mainland China, they had a development company in mainland China, which had an AUM of close to 2 billion euro. Uh, he's listed companies on the London Stock Exchange as well as the Singapore Stock Exchange. Uh, he's also responsible for the development of Battersea Power Station in London. So he's an extremely well-accomplished uh, real estate developer um, and continues to be. So Bartra as a group develop uh, quite a wide range of assets and um, Richard's track record uh, globally um, is, is very impressive and it's a demonstration of the quality of the work that has continued to be done at Bartra. Um, you can see some of the previous projects here, uh, the Ritz-Carlton, which was the first and only Ritz-Carlton in Ireland. Uh, Central Plaza was one of the developments in Shanghai, and then a variety of um, very high profile offices in Ireland, uh, including the, the Google headquarters. Um, the location or the fact that Google are located in Ireland is, um, is a very significant point. I'm sure a lot of people are aware that Ireland is somewhat of a tech hub um, and it's home to every major, very successful technology company you can think of um, and pharmaceutical companies aviation leasing companies, there's a huge range of companies that are located in Ireland, um, which is why we're one of the only economies in the world that didn't actually go into a recession in Q1. Uh, the economy continued to grow. Um, the two sectors that are sort of the most prominent within that would be tech and pharma, which are two of the sectors which would be the least affected by the COVID implications. Um, so the Irish economy is extremely resilient and will continue to be, even in light of the current circumstances. The Irish economy um, is currently and has been the best performing economy in the EU for the last seven to eight years. Um, so it's an extremely successful, um, it's, a, it's a great success story at the Irish economy. Um, having bounced back from the global financial crisis, Ireland was the first company to come out of the um, IMF, um, the first country, sorry, to come out of IMF and it's, uh, as I said, has maintained sort of number one position in terms of European growth for um, a seven to eight year period. So in terms of what we do, um, we develop quite a wide range of assets, um, but there's only two that are relevant for today's conversation. And that's the uh, conversation around what investments qualify for immigration. So uh, the healthcare portfolio, our healthcare portfolio, and then our social housing portfolio. So these are two 
key priority areas that the government have identified. Um, and they've identified these um, as, as priority areas for investment um, with, within the IIP. Um, so basically, if you were to make an investment to either one of these categories, you would qualify under the program. Uh, our company is very well known. The brand is very well recognized. Um, we've been featured in a lot of media, uh, locally and internationally. Um, we recently opened an office in Hong Kong. We did that late last year and uh, we received a lot of publicity around that. Um, we're one of the only sort of project owners um, to have presence there. Um, and then a bigger sort of global outlets like Bloomberg um, and then all of the Irish outlets as well. Uh, I suppose this, this, this just demonstrates how well known we are and the, the reputation of the company. Um, we feature a lot, uh, as I mentioned, and that should bring investors a lot of comfort to see uh, how well recognized the brand is and to see the sort of uh, um, the quantum of work that's being done by us across a variety of development fields uh, in Ireland. Another, uh, I suppose, another area of the business that should bring a lot of comfort to investors. Um, we have very good partnerships with all of the major lend lenders in Ireland. Um, as a real estate developer, um, obviously, we were required to um, borrow a lot of money. Um, and having strong relationships with all the pillar banks is a very important part of that. Um, it's also a demonstration um, of the quality of what we're developing. Uh, and it's also a demonstration of the quality um, of the developer themselves. Um, so the three banks that are listed here are the three pillar banks in Ireland, Bank of Ireland, Allied Irish Bank and Ulster Bank. Uh, those are the three major banks that are operational in Ireland. And then there's a few non-bank lenders that are very active in Ireland. Um, in the global financial crisis, the Irish banks were partic hit particularly hard. Um, and in their absence, uh, sort of in the last few years, as banks were recovering, some non-bank lenders came in to fill the void, uh, particularly in commercial development lending. Um, and some of these um, are very, very large, Activate Capital, for example. That's a joint venture between the uh, Irish Strategic Investment Fund, which is a body of the government, and KKR, who are one of the largest hedge funds globally. Um, so we work with all these banks, as I mentioned, and we've got very good relationships with all of them. So what that demonstrates is that they're very happy with us as a borrower. Uh, they're very confident in us as a developer, uh, and they're very confident in the projects that we are developing. Uh, of which many of them are lenders. So our uh, network in Asia, um, which is where 95% of our clients come from, um, we've recently started to move into the Middle East, but traditionally all of our uh, network has come out of uh, Asia. Our first office started in Shanghai, and now we have five across Asia, um, uh, with the most recent being uh, Hong Kong, as I mentioned. Um, we've had over 270 uh, successful applications to Ireland and we maintain a 100% approval rate. So every applicant we've made, uh, every application we've made has, has been approved, um, which is uh, obviously extremely important uh, for you as a potential applicant to know that uh, every person we've dealt with has been successful. Um, there's also another part to this. I mentioned that the visa is, is granted for two years and then renewed for three. So at that renewal date, the government will have a look at the projects and make sure that things are where they need to be. Uh, and we have a 100% renewal rate also. So um, that's a very important thing to note. And it's an important uh, thing to be aware of when you're choosing a partner for Ireland. Um, and uh, we're the only uh, company in the country who can say both of those things. So I touched on these earlier. So the two areas that we're involved in are um, the um, nursing home side of the business and the social housing side of the business. Um, th these were listed as priorities by the Irish government. They're priority areas uh, in the country. Uh, the reason they're priority areas in the country is because um, they're both very undersupplied. Uh, nursing homes are undersupplied everywhere. That's a global thing. Um, and then social housing is, is particularly, um, it's, it's a particular issue at home in Ireland because um, after the financial crisis, I mentioned that the banks were in quite a lot of trouble at the time. So it took the banks a while to sort of recapitalize and get back on their feet, which meant there wasn't a lot of lending, uh, which meant there wasn't a lot of development. So there was a huge undersupply as a result of that. Um, there's a significant undersupply, which continues in, in the residential market. Um, and then as a result of that, obviously, there isn't uh, 
there isn't sufficient supply in the social housing market. So the Irish government, uh, the Irish government have, have just come in, a new government, well, it's being formalised tomorrow, so hopefully it will be tomorrow. Um, but one of the major commitments that they're, they've agreed to is, is the production of 50,000 social housing units. Um, I think the actual demand is, is, is in excess of that. So there's a huge number of social houses needed uh, by the government um, for, for the citizens. Uh, and then nursing homes uh, are massively undersupplied as well. I think the current waiting list for nursing homes is in the region of 10,000. So they're both massively undersupplied. Um, and another interesting thing about both of these asset categories is that they both derive their income from the Irish state. So they're both government backed assets as well, which is, which is very important if you're looking at, a, at making an investment to know that the, the sort of ultimate tenant is the Irish government uh, from a risk perspective, that's, that's incredibly important. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about each of these. Uh, as as um, you know, Andrew alluded to earlier, it's a fairly quick presentation, so we can't go into a huge amount of detail, but uh, we're both available after the call to get into more detail. So here's our previous projects. Um, this is, um, these are four at different stages. I'll just go to the next slide here. Um, so, uh, oh, wait, no, there shouldn't be any music on that, sorry. This, um, go back here, sorry. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, what, what the video is going to show, the, the, the music is still playing and I, I don't know why, but um, it's basically a, a, um, it's a live construction camera. It's, it's the footage from the construction camera. It's basically a time lapse from start to finish on our first nursing home. We put construction cameras uh, on all of our building sites and then we share these, uh, we share a link to these with, the, with our investors. Um, and basically the idea behind this, the reason we do this is it just gives a, a great level of confidence to the investors. Uh, and it also gives them visibility on their specific development and what, what they, where they invest their money. Um, we found this to be particularly effective in Asia. Um, and it's just a, a demonstration of transparency from us. Um, we, want to, we want investors to know that, you know, not all of them can come to Ireland regularly. So we want to know that whether they're based in uh, Asia, the Middle East, where, wherever they are, that they can sort of pull out their phone or get on their computer and just have a look at uh, where where their money is basically. Um, so you can see here in the um, in the second um, one of our social housing sites, there's a, an image from one of the, one of the construction cameras. Um, so um, on the nursing homes, I'll just quickly re re recap that uh, we've built three and we've got one more under construction. We'll start two more this year. We had a minor delay with COVID of about six weeks, where construction sites in Ireland were closed, but they've all reopened again, so we're back on track. Um, our ambition as a group is to build 1,500 beds. Uh, currently, we're at around 700, 800. Um, so we're, we're very much on track to meet that target. Um, we want to become the biggest developer of nursing homes in Ireland, which we are, and the biggest operator of nursing homes, which we will, we will become. Um, and nursing homes in Ireland, um, the ones that we build are public nursing homes. So these are nursing homes where the ultimate, um, the person who's ultimately paying uh, the fees uh, is the Irish government. So it works under something called the Fair Deal Scheme. Uh, and that's something that's done in conjunction with the, with the government of Ireland. Um, and then um, that particular investment is a five-year investment. And on that investment, we offer 4% interest. So it's 4% per annum um, for five years. And then moving on to social housing. So social housing is, is, is government housing. Um, it's just effectively housing that the government provide for people who are below a certain income threshold. Um, and the way this works from an investment and development point of view is that we would acquire land with our own capital. Uh, we would then sign an agreement with the government to lease those, to lease those units off us. Um, that agreement is a 25 year lease. It's called an enhanced lease. Uh, I can share more information on this afterwards. Um, and that 25 year lease, the, the value of the lease or the rent is 95% of market value. So you're getting almost market value and it's locked into a 25 year lease with the government. So it's incredibly safe from an investment perspective. Um, it's a government backed asset uh, and it's a hard asset. It's, it's the units themselves. So it's an incredibly safe investment. Uh, that's why we don't offer interest on these. Um, and Andres alluded to a lot of these programs offer things like government bonds. The Irish program doesn't offer a government bond, but our investment I think here is structured. So it's structured in such a way that it's almost as safe uh, if you can say that, um, as a government bond, because there's virtually no risk in this. Um, and the way we develop these is we do them in phases. So phase one here um, is sold out. 
and phase two we're currently raising for at the moment. And then within each, we'll have uh, a few different developments. And this is just to give diversity. diversity. So it's, it's almost like a fund structure, the way we have a few different projects within each phase. It also means that the phases are larger, so we don't need to sort of remarket every time we're doing a new development. So we'd like to keep them in sizes of sort of 40 to 60 million. Um, and as I said, this is a three year loan. And on these ones, it's a non-interest bearing loan. So we don't pay a return on this. Then the Irish program actually has one other investment type. Um, oh, I think there's another video. Yeah, it's, it's kind of got the music, which is a little bit annoying, but um, you get the idea. So this is a, a sped up version. So this is our second constru our social housing site. Um, and as you can see the progress going on, but when you log into this uh, normally as an investor, uh, you can just see the live footage. So you can actually see people walking around the site and different things happening. So it's, 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 it's a really cool feature actually. And it's something that brings a lot of comfort to investors. Um, and then the final one uh, I'll mention is the, um, the donation program. So the program, the Irish program has a donation option. Uh, I think a lot of the Caribbean ones have donation op options too. So basically your two choices are in it. Uh, it's just three choices. So it's an investment of 1 million into a nursing home for five years at 4% interest per annum, a three-year loan into social housing at three years, and then a 400,000 euro, 400, euro donation. So that's, that's money that's donated, given away, not, not, uh, not kind of um, returned. Um, and that's normally at 500,000, but if you group five investors together, i.e. if each person, if the total is 2 million, then each person is only required to pay 400,000. So we generally group our donations together and we work with uh, some of the biggest hospital groups in the country and then um, sort of homeless charities and um, uh, rescue, one of the major Irish rescue foundations as well. Um, so that's a very quick overview that I hope covers everything. Um, some quick points uh, to remember, um, just to make sure I'm okay on time. Uh, the social housing uh, and the nursing home developments both derive their income from the state, um, which is inc incredibly attractive from an investment point of view um, and a risk mitigation point of view. Um, we work with every major lender in Ireland. Um, these lenders are uh, the biggest banks in the country. Um, they've got very compre comprehensive due diligence arms as all uh, professional lenders do. So they uh, really analyze all of our projects at a deep level um, and then they invest in them. So it demonstrates that they're very confident with us as a developer and they're very confident with projects uh, that we are developing and confident enough to, to lend us large amounts of money, uh, which is very important, obviously. Um, and then, um, yeah, we've obviously got all the various insurances in place. We're one of the largest developers in Ireland um, and we develop over quite, quite a number of fields um, with social housing and healthcare being the two that qualify for the program. So um, I think I'm getting close to wrap up here. So um, uh, I know we have a Q&A, Andres, Shortly after yes. this, right? Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. No, I, I, I think that to be honest with you was a, was a great presentation. I mean, thank, thanks, uh, thanks for that, James. Um, oh, I stopped sharing, right? Yeah, yeah, as, as you wish. Yes. Let me let me just share my my screen as well. That that I will put. I mean, we can we can leave it there. But I think that it was a, a, a great um, a great presentation, and it is the idea of having the Irish program and um, part of one of the. The, the Caribbean citizenship specifically solution in this case it is because there are two things which uh, which are common to both uh, and one is the fact that as, as you said I mean there is no capital at risk you know with uh, with the IP in, uh, in Ireland I mean you are not going to make the investment until you get approved and uh, it is something that also happens in the Caribbean that gives a lot of um, you know a lot of comfort to, to the client I think that is a great great feature a great great feature it's not like happens you know Portugal, Spain, uh, uh, Greece, uh, they have right. the golden visas and, uh, you know, it's just one, you first you need to do the investment and then you are granted a visa. Uh, theoretically, you can you can be at a trial if you just do the investment for the visa. And in Ireland, it doesn't happen that. And I think that is a major point. Um, and specifically as well for, for education, which you were saying that. I mean, if you have uh, some further information, you know, about, uh, about Ireland as a country, education possibilities and all that sort of things. 
I think it will be really relevant for the audience um, because uh, one of the main motivators at the end of the day for economic migration, it is those, uh, those future possibilities that their children can acquire in this case in Ireland, you know, by education and then by, um, by the companies that, that they are there, where they can work and all their stuff. I think that it is a great program for, for that sake, to be honest with you. Yeah, and just on the topic of education, uh, the fact that Ireland is the home to so many of these uh, major corporations, um, that's a very good perspective. There's a very good point in relation to education as a follow on. So, I mean, if you're a graduate in Ireland, uh, after graduation, you've got Facebook, Google, Apple, Dell, everyone on your doorstep. And they're all there in a very big way. Um, this isn't like a kind of a tax haven where there's, you know, a brass plate and an office with two or three people. Google have got over 10,000 people here. Apple have over 10,000 people, Microsoft have close to that, Amazon are expanding massively. So all of these companies are here in a very, very big way um, and they all run uh, graduate programs, they all have big uh, recruitment drives every year, they do internships, all these uh, options are available to people um, and they're on your doorstep because Ireland is a, it's a relatively small city, about 1.3 million people um, and all of these companies are here. So it's a very good place to graduate uh, because as I said, post-graduation, all of these guys are on your doorstep. So that's a, that's an important factor, I think, when people are considering Ireland as, as an investment, as an investment immigration choice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the main drivers, as, as, as you know, uh, as well as, as, as myself, they are basically that, you know, the education nowadays, you know, the healthcare. I mean, we have seen that driving, you know, from Southeast Asia and, uh, and from certain places in Africa as well, you know, looking at, at Europe, you know, I mean, how, in, in our case, as we're based in Malta, how Malta has, you know, dealt with COVID and how Cyprus and, uh, you know, and then people, they look at, uh, at Spain, it's just like, it's just like, it is not, uh, it is, we, we, we in Spain now, now I'm in Spain for COVID as well. And uh, it's been very, very tough here as well, to be honest with you. Had a, Spain had a, had a massive, um, quite uh, quite quite at all so i mean not those those sort of things we're going to bounce but spain is going to bounce back uh, because it has a good healthcare system but the way that is handled happens with the us i mean uh, i read in the um, i think it was in the in the Forbes or the financial times uh, a few weeks ago that, that people are thinking okay where i'm going to go you know in september for education um and that 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 is a, a really good argument and and i believe that now with all this pandemic, we're going to be near that asset tool that as for investment migration. And we're going to see that, that driven, you know, to in, the, in your case of Ireland, uh, more the Cyprus, Europe, you know, in terms of, of global mobility for education, health care, and so on. So cool, that's that's brilliant. Let me check, uh, let me check here. I mean, we have um, I have a question here. Uh, this is basically for St. Lucia. I believe, uh, and says basically, what do you mean by holding period, and also what is the difference between national development fund and uh, COVID fund? How to decide which one to opt for? Uh, holding period is the the time that you have to have those bonds in your position. Basically, uh, you have to buy the bonds, have them in your position, have them uh, on your name for five years, six years, or seven years, and after that, you're able to sell them all. Basically, you're, you're going to be repaid those, those loans and you will get that money back. As it happens with, uh, with, with some, um, with one of the, the options in Ireland, these are non-bearing interest bonds. In this case, they are bonds. Um, so that is uh, one thing to consider. And the second part of the question is, uh, and also what is the difference between the National Development Fund versus the COVID, uh, fund. Uh, basically, the difference is that National Development Fund it is a contribution. The money goes and doesn't come back in the, com the COVID. They are government bonds. The COVID is a special government bond option that the government, that the government enabled two or three weeks ago. The difference is that National Development Fund, money goes, and uh, COVID fund, you invest. It is not a fund. You invest in government bonds, and after five years of the holding period, you get repaid. Any questions, any further questions, please uh, send me a message or contact me privately, no worries. And then we have here, basically, the OECD has classified St. Lucia CDI program scheme as a high-risk scheme for the common for the CRS program. Is there any issue on account of this? How does financial institution handle this? Uh, it is true. I mean, uh, OECD has classified not only St. Lucia, but uh, it is not necessarily St. Lucia CDI program. It's basically St. Lucia CDI programs in other Caribbean jurisdictions. Um, yes, I mean, it's, it's been uh, classified as a high-risk scheme. 
any issue on account of this. Uh, to be honest with you, I have many clients from the Caribbean programs for the past five years that you know they, they get their passport and uh, then they're able to travel worldwide. You know, like you know that this immigration is not not an issue on that. How does financial institutions handle this? Well, I mean that is quite a difficult question because uh, you have different options, opinions within. Uh, the financial market and the financial institutions. I mean, that uh, that basically will depend on the financial institutions more than than myself. But I'm happy to answer any of these uh, questions, Bernard. If if you have any any further, also please uh, please contact me as well. So that is uh, answered openly as well. So um, I don't know if if there's anything else that that you, James, you would like to uh, to to share in terms of the the IIP program, anything that uh, that you would like to mention. Um, what, what about in terms of, because in terms of the Irish program, you get you get granted residence in Ireland, you have that special status with the UK uh, afterwards, which is very, very interesting once you get your citizenship and stuff. Uh, but once you get the, the residence, basically, your residence card in Ireland, does that give you any, um, any travel rights, you know, within the EU or within the UK or how, how does that no, the, the, um, generally when people are looking at the Irish program, they're looking at it uh, because of the benefits of Ireland. Um, I think that if people are concerned about free travel, uh, there's much cheaper options out there. Um, you know, um, I, I'd look at Ireland as a kind of a longer term solution and then other countries that have sort of travel benefits as a shorter term solution. It depends what the ultimate desire is. To answer your question, uh, an Irish stamp for visa, which is basically Irish PR, doesn't give any sort of preferential travel treatment um, in the EU or the UK, um, provided of course that your original passport didn't have those travel requirements. So now we're getting a lot of Hong Kong clients um, and the Hong Kong passport holders can get 90 days in the EU and I think 180 in the UK, whatever it is. So it's kind of irrelevant for them, but if, if you're holding a PRC passport uh, or if you're holding a passport from a country that doesn't have the 90 days or the 180 days, then even if you have, even with your Irish stamp for visa, you'd still need to get a travel visa to go into your into the Schengen area. Um, so Ireland isn't a part of the Schengen area. So the reason I suppose that um, the reason that um, you know if you give a Portugal Portugal golden visa or a Spanish golden visa, what enables you to travel on those visas if you wanted to go and you know spend a week or two in Greece or whatever, you can do that. Um, and that's because of the Schengen, and that's a Schengen thing as opposed to an EU thing. Um, but with the Portuguese or the Spanish one, you couldn't go to the UK, for example, because they're not Schengen. So you'd need another visa for that. Um, so generally when people are asking about this sort of stuff and the travel requirements, you really need to, uh, I, I try and drill down to what, what is the role company looking for? Um, you know, if it's, are you looking for a, an easy way to travel around Europe? Then, you know, there's very cheap options where you can get, um, like like some of the, 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 the type of passports you, you alluded to or you're talking about, um, you know, they can give you uh, EU travel, no problem. Um, it's, it's not that difficult for certainly for PRC applicants now to get a sort of three or five year business visa to travel around Schengen. Um, so, I mean, if travel is the option, then if travel is the ultimate sort of ambition and the reason the driver behind this, then there's way cheaper and much more efficient ways of doing that. But if you're looking for a country where you'd like your children to be educated uh, in one of the best education systems in the world. If you're looking for the best performing economy in Europe, if you're looking for, you know, the only English speaking country in the EU, um, all of these fundamentals behind Ireland, this is really the driver, I think, behind the success of the program. And I think that's, those are the sort of things that people are thinking about when, when they're choosing Ireland. Uh, so it differs uh, greatly from some of the other programs in that regard, because it's, it's what I would categorize as sort of a, a fundamental immigration destination it would be more in, in league of uh, I suppose the US and Canada and Australia, which were tr traditionally the strongest immigration markets and uh, for a variety of reasons, including waiting times and changing of, um, changing of the criteria and stuff that's changed. Uh, but Ireland is unequivocally the best choice in, for an English speaking country uh, globally right now. Um, and the, the government are uh, making some positive changes to the program. Uh, we used to have four or five allocation windows. So basically like periods in which you could make the application a year and they've abolished that now. So people can make their application as soon as it's ready, which is which is a good step. It makes it more efficient. It also means people can uh, apply sort of when they're ready, not have to wait for a window. That's a really good step. Um, 
and then um, yeah, as I said, there's a new government coming in hopefully tomorrow. Um, there was um, the it's going to be a tri-party uh, government, so the, the three-party coalition and the third element of the coalition was is, is currently having a vote. The uh, the result of which come out tomorrow. So all going well, the government will be in situ as of tomorrow, and with a new government, invariably, as we've seen in some of the examples of the Caribbean, um, generally, if the program is important to the economy, then the government will usually make some positive changes, and we're hoping that could be the case here, but until the government are in it, it it's kind of hard to speculate on that, but um, I would anticipate that they might make some enhancements to the program, which would be great. Yeah, that, that, that would be fantastic. I think that I, I, I 100% second that, I mean, at the end of the day, people see and I see the Irish program as uh, an effective relocation to Europe, basically, rather than, you know, you're Greek, you're Portuguese, or you whatever. It's just that it is more a passive, um, a passive relocation, let's put it that way. With, with the Irish program, you do it for your children, you do it for, your edu- for, the, for their education in their future. It's more, um, uh, basically, uh, it's, more, if, it's more an economic movement, uh, and I see there. There's, there's one question, actually, for you um, that Jay sent, and uh, basically to James, from a capital protection point of view, can investor get 100% repayment on maturity? And the four the four percent annual return it is guaranteed. Yeah, so um, the repayments are a maturity. Yeah, so the 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 shortest period alone can be is three years. That's set by the government. So the, the government said so the, the shortest period that the money needs to be invested for is three years. So our, our social housing uh, loans are three years. That means after three years the money is repaid. Uh, in in their non interest bearing. So the second part of that question isn't relevant. But is that guaranteed? Yes, uh, our parent company. So we have a, a parent company for each development division. So our nursing home division has a nursing home parent, which owns all of our nursing homes. That company gives a guarantee uh, for repayment. So there's a gar- parent company guarantee asset back um, in both nursing home and social. Um, and then the second part of the question uh, it was re- returns. Yeah, so the returns are actually accrued and paid on exit. Um, as you can imagine, there's a development cycle with nursing homes where we, we, we get the land, we build the asset itself, then we need to put people into the asset. So it needs to take time to sort of fill up uh, and start producing income and sort of working as a nursing home. So the development cycle is just a bit longer. So we have the money for a longer period of time. Uh, and as a result of that, we, we pay an interest coupon uh, to make it attractive. So we have one that's a quicker loan time and no interest, and then one that's a bit longer but well, because it's a bit longer, we give an interest coupon on that. And the interest coupon is 4% uh, interest per annum. And that's accrued and paid on exit. So basically after the five years, the repayment amount would be 1.2 million. Um, and they, it's, um, I think in this day and age, a 4% interest coupon uh, is quite attractive when you compare it to sort of what, what your money would get if it was in a, a passive investment or something like that. Um, uh, particularly when the investment itself, the underlying investment itself, is, is so low risk. Um, so, so we do see a lot of uptake in that option, um, especially from, from some of our Hong Kong investors. And as we come into the Middle East and India, I, I think that would be the, the more attractive option. Um, I, um, some of our uh, mainland Chinese investors are, are very conservative, so they kind of want to just have the shortest possible investment term. So that's why the three-year option is more desirable, perhaps, for them. Um, but I mean, it's, we just have two choices for people, so it's up to them, really. But to answer the question, then, yeah, the investments are guaranteed, and so are the returns. That is, that, is, that is really good. I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's a really good option, even with a three-year time. I mean, with a four-year, obviously, as well. But when you look at that, the, 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 the reason behind doing all these, it is just basically to uh, relocate effectively to Ireland, in this case, or have the children educated in Ireland, and blah, blah, blah. Having a... On top of that, having a four percent accrued and warranted after uh, after, four, after five years, it is just like uh, it is a massive thing. It's a proper investment, a proper immigration, which is something to be honest with you that it is not easily seen uh, in the investment migration arena. I mean, when you look at uh, the Caribbean programs, completely different reasons why people would do it, obviously. But when you look at the Caribbean programs, you don't have uh, warranted returns, literally. Um, they, they, so Lucia government bonds, they are not bearing interest rates. Rate. There are some developers in the Caribbean that just give you 1% until the construction has ended, but then there's no uh, whatever. In, uh, in real estate, basically in Europe happens the same because here, I mean, you have that plus, which, uh, which I think it makes a lot of sense 
uh, because it ties up basically that um, uh, that business rational with the personal rational for the applicant. And that's why I think it is so, so strong, the, the Irish program. Yeah, the, um, uh, like I use language of uh, alignment of interest. So um, the way we work as a developer is that um, the investor's interest is paid first. So that they have priority to anything we can take out. So basically our profit is after that. So as a developer, I mean, the ultimate, um, one of the main drivers is, is sort of the return on investment and, and the profit margin ultimately. So uh, the fact that our interests are very much aligned with the investor, so that we only make money after their loan has been repaid, uh, that really much that very much aligns us. Um, and um, the I think the, the government program here, um, the IP itself, is, is run in a very intelligent way. Um, I know you spoke about some of the other European ones that are real estate backed. I question the, the overall economic benefit of them. And then in the, in the Caribbean, and it was a bunch of different ones, but th what the government here uh, are doing is basically using the program to channel funding into areas that need it the most. Um, as I said, the, health, the nursing homes and social housing are the two of the most undersupplied asset categories, just really as a result of uh, not enough building happening. So to use the program as a means to channel funding into them, I think, I think is quite smart. Uh, and then the way we operate as a developer is that we create an aligned interest with our investors so that basically we're not going to make anything out of this unless we do what we do best, which is make very successful assets. Um, so there's an alignment of interest there, which I think should bring a lot of comfort to investors. Absolutely. At the end of the day, that's, that's the reason why you have 270 investors, you know, and, uh, and approved at the end of the day, you know, it is, uh, it is very important. It's one of the things that uh, when, when you talk about the real estate developments and, uh, and investment, uh, being in the, in the market within, especially with the Caribbean ones that you need to, uh, you need to like invest in, in developments and so on, it is always that, you know, light in the head of the clients and saying, okay, is it happening? Is it not? I mean, it's going to, be finished it is not and uh here not only you have the track record but also you have um that people they know that they are putting money in somewhere that is needed which is what I did. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of those um a lot of those concerns are, are what we try and deal with in the structuring of the deal so i mean we were we, we launched in mainland china where at the time eb5 was the dominant program so we sort of looked at some of the big risk factors for EB-5 and um, some of them, I suppose, are the same in, in the Caribbean, I guess, uh, that, you know, people aren't sure if the development's going to go ahead and they're not entirely sure where their money is and all these types of things. So at each step, we, we try to mitigate that. That's why we put the live construction cameras on there so that people can actually come in and see in real time the projects going on. Um, it's, why, it's why we work with the banks with all of our projects so that we can give that layer of comfort to the clients to know that, like, you know, you, you're investing alongside an Irish pillar bank. Um, who will only go into a deal having done substantial due diligence uh, on, on both the developer and the development. Uh, so a lot of, you know, the work that they might not have the capacity to do in terms of due diligence uh, is done for them uh, by, by the other lenders. So that brings a lot of comfort too. So we've, we've sort of analyzed the structure of the deal. We came at the deal in a way where it was very, um, it was very risk focused uh, and it was sort of risk mitigation focused so, so we could eliminate a lot of those because I think ultimately the people who are making these decisions uh, and these investments, uh, it's not really a traditional investment where they're investing for a return. I think the, the real driver behind this is, is, is the residency and, you know, it's more of a, a parking of capital than, than, a, than a strategic investment. So I think what people are really looking for here is to know that their capital is safe and they're going to get it back. That's the, the main things I've seen from, from our clients is that they just want to know that their, their investment is going into somewhere um, uh, where it's going to be safe. It's going to, it's going to do what it needs to do to meet the requirements of the program. And then after that period of time, be it three or five years, that they get their capital back. Um, and that's how we've built our deals to guarantee that that happens. That's brilliant. That's, that's, that's excellent. Well, I think that we are more or less in, uh, in an hour now, a little bit more of an hour. Um, if you want, we, we can call it day. Um, we stay in touch with you, James. If any of us, you, you have any questions, please direct it to, to James, to myself. I will direct you to, to James. If you need any further information from the Irish IAP, please contact James at uh, James Hatz. Uh, which, which is your, your email address, James? Bart Bartra Wealth Advisors. Dot com and Bartra is called B-A-R-T-R-A um, and then our, our, our website URL and um, there'll be details on there too so it's just Bartra 
if you Google Bartra, B-A-R-T-R-A, you'll see a bunch of stuff. Actually, if you Google Bartra, there's a football player called Bartra, so he comes up <laughs> after him. <laughs> we're, we're, we're there. Um, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Excellent. Brilliant. Okay, so, thanks, well, thanks, thanks very much, much um, for, for your time. and Thanks for setting this up, uh, Andres. I really appreciate it. And, and thank you to the, the audience for uh, taking the time to come and, and see this today. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thanks very much for, for your time too, James. It's been a pleasure and I uh, will stay in touch. Thanks very right. much, everyone. Thank you much. We'll see yep. you next time. Cheers.